You know, if you're like me and you're wondering, why is uric acid and gout becomes this sort of modern topic? You hear it all over the place, that, that and insulin resistance. But what about uric acid? What about gout? Why is it a big deal? As you get into it, you realize, oh my gosh, the, the rates have quadrupled in the last 70 years or so. And yet gout has been around for hundreds of years. We know all that before. We've heard about gout. You know, it's the disease of the affluent and the kings and so on and so forth. But I think to stop the noise on all of this and make some sense of what you can do for yourself, that that's why you're listening to this, then we need to understand what were the causes, the known causes that we know in history through thousands of years, actually. So we're gonna explore that, come up to the present, and we're gonna find out that there are three distinct phases of gout increase. And by knowing that, we will have some actionable information for ourselves to make some changes. And we'll go beyond that in subsequent videos. But let's get started. We need to know why the current understanding of uric acid is dangerously incomplete. My words, dangerously incomplete. You might say, AKA, a little bit on the naive side, hypersimplistic, as is most of conventional medicine. So we're gonna go into some details, come up with a conclusion, and even though this is not a one size fits all, we need to establish a framework of understanding that we can, within ourselves, move some of what I call the chessboard pieces around. What are the bigger factors that can be adjusted? Okay, let's go. Well, welcome to Eastern North Carolina in the autumn, in the middle of pecan season. So how do I know it's pecan season? We don't have a pecan tree on our tree, which they grow all over the place because our neighbor has a couple. And we see a squadron of squirrels that get the nuts in the morning, go across, eat them on our deck, and then I guess bury a few in the next yard over. So this is what a pecan looks like before. Somebody left it behind. This is what it looks like after. And they've gotten so habituated to this sort of freeway of pick up your pecans, stop by and eat at the gold camps, that I think they'll be asking for coffee soon. Anyway, what I want to tell you about the three phases of uric acid and how it really matters that you understand this because you tend, most of us that listen to this particular video are thinking that uric acid is kind of an esoteric sort of lab. What the heck? I mean, if I was to ask anybody around here, they go, who, what? Who, what? And so, I know that you know more about that, but it's really important to see how did uric acid change through evolution? And obviously we can't go back millions of years and say uric acid with this was a certain way, but I can give you the context and that will really help you understand in checking in on your own uric acid level, understanding your own uric acid level and questioning what things to, to change. So there's always a project, eh? One thing after another. So the first thing I wanna tell you about is we went last week from pre, uh, we went to uh, Paleolithic time, and now we're gonna shoot into what they call a Neolithic time. Well, yeah, these are just terms I understand, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring you to 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years ago is what is called the agricultural revolution. And it happened in a place called the Fertile Crescent. Pretty interesting. Call it the Middle East. It's Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, and of course, Egypt. That was the Fertile Crescent. That's where what we claim, and we now have all the DNA to back it up and the archeological finds to back it up, is that where it got started. That's where we went from hunter-gatherer to farming into domesticating various animals. It's absolutely fascinating. It happened in this rather intense area and spread out from there. You need to know that area because that's gonna come up a couple times in the story. So it was about 10,000 years ago. We shifted from meat-based, if you will, meat-fish-based, and maybe some fruits, primarily berries, and that was it, to growing grains, grains, and we have certain animals that are still there, of course, because they're here today. And the Next phase is going to be when sugar showed up. Where the heck did sugar come from? Sugar came from Papua New Guinea. Erie and Jaya, Papua New Guinea. If you know that part of the world, I'll point it out to it later. It came from there and it took a number of thousand years to go to China, India. By the time it showed up to the Fertile Crescent, the Middle East, it was about 700 AD. And from there, I'll continue. But that's the thing you need to know. We had 
three phases. We had the Paleolithic last week. We now are the Fertile Crescent where we have the grains, the development of all the grains and all these carbohydrates. Because what comes out of that? Alcohol. 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 Alcohol as a ritualistic thing to take. Alcohol as a kind of special after work sort of thing. And I'm not making it up. Absolutely. It was big time present. And then, so that's 10,000 to roughly six to 800 AD, going from the Middle East to Western Europe for the sugar to show up. So by the time of, let's say, Leonardo da Vinci, Columbus, Henry VIII, and they were all, um, they were all current with each other. They were all at the same time period, actually all lived at the same time. So two of the, three of those had gout. We're gonna assume that that's elevated uric acid. It's questionable. We think that Columbus did too, but he had a lot of other situational circumstances. So these are the phases. Moving into agriculture, domestication, and farming for the grains and the alcohol to the sugar. And then the last phase is, I'll hold that. Coming to it in a bit. So we have three phases. Why are they so important and why are they so interesting to you in trying to understand your uric acid? Well, when you have a kind of a diet of just of meat, and let's say of, of organ meat as well, that's pretty straightforward. We got all the variables covered, right? Well, then we come into the agricultural revolution, the Neolithic age, and now we have all these grains and alcohol is quickly discovered, not just from rotting fruit, but it's discovered from, you can ferment grains, now they're getting pretty clever. Not only do they have wines and you have beer, but you now are getting into distilled alcohols. So that changes everything because your biochemistry, your biology, your metabolism really wasn't geared towards alcohol. That was kind of not a good deal. Okay, you know that the cause of gout and elevated uric acid really hasn't changed much since the time of Hippocrates. That was a pretty broad and really clear documentation of what gout was. There were obviously earlier cases back in 2642 BC, so about 5,000 year, years ago in Egypt. But when Hippocrates came along, he wrote down everything, very well documented, and you'll see things have not changed completely at all, or really at all. Okay, so what we have is initially, back in his day, it was high purines and high alcohol. High purines and high alcohol, right? Because we had, we're now, oh, many thousands of years post the agriculture revolution, and things are moving along. It's a pretty civilized society, a lot of alcohol, a lot of carbohydrates, and that was pretty much it. And of course, we have purines. And then things evolved to this other possibly more complicated answer, which is high purines, alcohol, and fructose, or fructose. And that's kind of where it is today. That's the end of the story relative to conventional medicine. And that's not really the end of the story. It certainly confused me because that had nothing to do with me. It had nothing to do with a lot of people. It says, you know, I don't do the fructose. I don't do much in the way of high purines. What's my issue? Well, let's look a little more deeply. Okay, so we got to ask, when did sugar show up in the world? and who got gout because of the sugar. This is really a history of elevated uric acid. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. Where did sugar come from? First of all, it was sugar cane. We're gonna be talking about sugar cane through this whole thing up until the 1800s. So it's sugar cane, okay? Not sugar beet, sugar cane. So it came from Papua New Guinea. This is all part of Indonesia, it's Sulawesi, that's Irian Jaya, or otherwise known as Borneo but that's where it started. So there's traces, archeological traces of this 10,000 years ago. Well, 10,000 years ago, it took a long time to get to the Middle East. It took a long time to spread. So here's a little history of that. Papua New Guinea, 10,000 years ago, 510 BC. That was a quick jump forward, wasn't it? The emperor of Persia invaded India where he found the reed that gives honey without bees. Pretty clever, kind of poetic. Did everybody talk like that? And then 350, island hopping advanced to ancient India. So now we're to China and India, as you'll see in a second. 642, the Arabs invaded Persia, Iran, and found sugarcane being grown, learned how sugarcane was made, established sugar production in other conquered lands in North Africa and Spain. The Muslims really brought sugar across the Mediterranean. 
not into Northern Europe, but certainly across the Mediterranean, as you'll see. Now in 900, just remember this, what I call nine, six to 900 is a critical, critical era for Northern Europe, meaning France, Germany, England, and certainly Scandinavia. In 16 and 1069, the first sugar was recorded in England, 1069. So you think of 1066, the Battle of Hastings and all these other things. This is like, this is pretty current. This is when the Duke William of Normandy and so on. This is basically when France was now claiming part of England. Okay, came to Western Europe as a result of the Crusades, the 11th century AD, brought sugar to the Holy Lands where they encountered caravans carrying sweet salt. So they discovered, huh, what is this stuff? So 1100s, European sugar was refined in Venice, Italy, set up estates to produce sugar for export to the rest of Europe, where it supplemented honey as the only other available sweetener, described sugar as a most precious product, very necessary for the use in health of mankind. So they were considering it a medicine. Huh. They're considering it a medicine. 1412, a traveler in Egypt wrote of a mosque, a complete mosque that was built from sugar. Europeans would see these things and they would copy them. Maybe not as big as a mosque, but it takes the same ideas. Now we're going further into the 1500s and 1600s. What you have is Henry VIII. He lived from late 1400s, 1500s. Leonardo da Vinci, Christopher Columbus, they were basically born the same year, 1451 and two. But the point was, Really, all three of them, two of the three definitely had gout. I'm not quite sure about Christopher Columbus. He was exposed to a lot of other things. They kind of divided on that, but certainly Henry VIII had gout and he had it for a long time. He's a huge person. So he hired seven cooks to create a sugar banquet. Did this on a number of occasions. Had his own confectioner expert who was in charge of cooking with sugar. Sweetened wine and beer were the drinks of the day. Amazing. So sugar was everything. If you can put sugar in it, put sugar in it. So in 1625, the English seized the Barbados, set up sugar plantations, and started importing slaves from Africa. And by 1700, 50,000 slaves were being worked to death in the Barbados. And that brings you up to 1800, which is now the rise of the sugar beet industry. And that changes things, but not in terms of bringing in more sugar. Sugar was well established. It was confectionery. It was in everything. So when sugar was more valuable than gold, this is in the thousand, uh, eight, a thousand, two thousand, fourteen, twelve. That traveler in, in Egypt wrote of a mosque built of sugar. Europeans would take these same ideas and customize them. That was just an image of a mosque, but can you imagine a mosque this size being made of sugar? All right. So the history of sugar was this: Papua New Guinea, as I showed you, four thousand, four thousand years ago, well established. 10,000 years ago, earliest traces of cane domestication on the Pacific island of New Guinea, Papua New Guinea, and sugar only became available after 600 AD from, er from Egypt to Western Europe. So it's really, let's look at this. They went from Papua New Guinea, it wasn't until 4,000 did it start to migrate into China and India. It reached the Middle East by 700 to 800. So this is the cradle of civilization we'll see in the second, but this is 700 AD. So it took a long time, 10,000, that's about 8,000 years more or less, where the agricultural revolution happened. This is what they call the Fertile Crescent. So the countries that take, that compose that today are Iran, Iraq, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and Egypt. So basically this area, Mesopotamia is a Greek word for the area between the two rivers. So this is the cradle of civilization and or called the Fertile Crescent. You can see it's at the beginning of all of the Mediterranean. It's important to know this. So this is where we change from Paleolithic to Neolithic, from hunter-gatherer or nomadic way of just chasing the game and coming and moving wherever the game was to staying put and developing agriculture and animal domestication. It's a big pivot. Also, it was going on at this time as the earth was actually warming up. The last eight ice age was 14,000 years ago. So other things were happening, but for whatever reason, we were at this location and civilization starting to flourish. Carbohydrates had arrived. They came in primarily two forms or one of two forms. They came from grains, all the different grains, the wheats, the sorghum, the, the barley, the, and so on and so forth. So from that fermented grains was beer, alcohol, what the Fertile Crescent is today. This is where wine started about 7,500 years ago, and they have archeological finds to back this up and chemical analysis and so on and so forth. Very fascinating. And beer, 13,000 years ago, started in Israel, what is now Israel today. 
So still, both are in the Fertile Crescent, the Middle East. But notice that beer was roughly 6,000 years before wine got started. So 5,000 years ago, this is about gout, a timeline, up to the present. So here we go, just to give you it stretched out. The first documented case was 2,600 years ago, uh, 5,000 years ago, 2,640 BC. Then you had Hippocrates, 400 BC, Alexander the Great. So there's plenty of gout patients of Hippocrates. So we called it the unwalkable disease. Alexander the Great, who died at, I think it was 23 or 27, he had gout at a very young age, wow. Here's the AD divide line, but here's the sugar divide line, seven to 800 AD I put, seven to 800. Um, and now we have after the sugar line, there's AD, after the sugar line, Charlemagne, Henry VIII, Leonardo da Vinci, as we mentioned before. Now we get into 1700s, all the founding fathers and gout. And then if you wanna go further, Lawrence and Olivier, I could have populated this with case on case on case, but you sort of get the idea that it's been continuing and maybe there's a theme here, but so far we're looking at really three variables. First, it was hunter-gatherer nomadic, and so you had purines. We don't even know if there was any gut then. Then there was the grains, enter the sugar, or enter the carbohydrates, enter the alcohol, then enter the sugar, come roughly seven to 800 in Europe, that is. So do we have a match? Here's what Hippocrates said about gout. And this could be from any modern textbook today. Not a word needs to be changed. So eunuchs, well, we don't have eunuchs anymore. Eunuchs do not take the gout nor become bulk. They don't, they don't bulk up. So they don't have the muscle mass and they obviously don't have the testicles. So their testosterone is low. So this is me writing in the answers of what he's defining is low testosterone. So they have low testosterone. Woman does not take the gout unless her menses have stopped. So postmenopausal estrogen decline. When they are premenopausal, estrogen is what they call uricosuric, which is protective. A youth does not get gout before sexual intercourse. That's interesting. I would say it's about testosterone. In gouty affections, inflammation subsides within 40 days. That is about the average of an episode of gout. Well, now they have higher medications that work for some, don't work for others. But when they do work, if you didn't have any medications, it'd be about 40 days. Still hasn't changed. So the average episode of gout is still that long today. Gouty affections become active in spring and autumn. So it's a seasonality of gout. Back to what we're talking about. So why in spring? Spring would be pretty much a vitamin C deficiency. Last time they had any vitamin C back at this time at 400 BC was with the fruits and so on and so forth. Well, fruits only last so long, they rotted, they died, maybe turned into alcohol. And so now they basically have a vitamin C deficiency. As we talked about in other videos about vitamin C is protective and helps you excrete gout. What about the autumn? Well, the autumn is kind of the obvious one. That's when you're eating all the grains, right? So now you're getting all those high omega-6s. You're eating all those fruits, which are harvestable. So you're getting high fructose, high omega-6, getting fat for the winter, because that's what you're gonna live off of. However, you're also getting very gout prone. Let's look at the timeline of alcohol consumption. Here we go. Alcohol drinks predated agriculture. Let me say that again. Alcoholic drinks predated agriculture. In fact, it is thought that it was because of alcohol, the desire for alcoholic, uh, alcoholic drinks that led to agriculture and civilization. Two great articles, one from the BBC, world's oldest brewery found in a cave in Israel. That was 2018. And the other from the New York Times. All right, again, this is just going over briefly. 10,000 years ago, grape pips, which are the leftovers of squishing grapes, attested the possible wine consumption in a cave in Greece. 10,000, that's way a long time ago. Ninth millennium BCE, the earliest domesticated fruit was the fig tree. So it wasn't the grapes, it was the fig tree. Eighth millennium, domestication of rice and barley crops were used for production of fermented alcohol occurred about 10,000 years ago. 7,000, earliest evidence of wine production comes from jars in India, fermented rice, honey, and fruit. 5,000 years ago, I'll say, people produced resonated wine on a fairly large scale in Iran. So now we're saying bonafide, this is a different source, bonafide information, Iran is the home of wine. 4,000 years ago, a platform used for crushing grapes and process moved crushed grapes to storage jars and evidence of wine production in Armenia. Fourth century BCE, by the beginning of the fourth century, fourth millennium BCE, 
Wine and beer were produced in many locations in Mesopotamia, between the two rivers, Assyria and Anatolia, which is basically Turkey, and treated as elite luxury goods, 3400 to 2500 BC. Now we're up to the time of, of the first documented case of gout. In pre-dynastic community in Egypt had a large number of barley and wheat-based brewery installations. Okay, wine production. 7400 to 7000 years ago in Iran, the earliest evidence for wine production wine production in the form of chemical residues inside pots from this part in Iran, which is, there you go, Fertile Crescent. So, okay, I'm just briefly going through this. 2,000 years ago, it's more than obvious that alcohol is a big, big deal. I mean, it is, it is for everybody here. This is not just the elite. So, the Egyptian ate low-fat, high-fiber diets with a lot of grains, uh, plant oils, fat, bread, lentils, cottage cheese, etc., grapes, vegetables, honey, garlic, and other foods. The Egyptians ate a variety of grains, barley and emmer wheat, various different kinds of wheat. Um, I'm going to jump down to here at 5,000 years ago, which is the time of that first documented case. It said, under the certain king had three chambers, and his funeral chambers was stocked with oxen meat, water birds, cheese, dried figs, bread, and many vessels of beer and wine for the afterlife journey. So alcohol is a factor of increasing uric acid. Therefore, it's a factor in gout. Pretty straightforward. They knew this in 2640 BC, nearly 5,000 year, years ago, and it's still a factor today. It may not be your factor. It might not be my factor. It's part of my factor. I like dry farm wines, but it's not everybody's. Okay, collusion to the study was episodic alcohol consumption, regardless of the type of alcoholic beverage, was associated with an increased risk of recurrent gout attacks, including potentially with moderate amounts. Therefore, persons with gout should limit alcohol intake of all types to reduce the risk of recurrent gout attacks. This goes a little bit different uh, against other studies that say, well, wine's okay. So take it for what it is. Alcohol's on the table. It's been around for thousands of years. And so has documented cases of gout. But when did alcohol show up? Well, it showed up, as I just showed you, since the agricultural revolution 13,000 years ago for beer, 7,500 years ago for wine. Factors that create uric acid. The largest proportion of uric acid load comes from metabolism itself. This is really key to understanding your gout. You know, it's very hyper simplistic to say, oh, it's just about purines, it's just about purines. And purines could be from having too much organ meats, which for me, it was like, I love liver. I have a lot of liver. I had to cut back on that. I didn't stop having liver. I cut back on it. But this was Paleolithic time, clearly the biggest variable. When you bring, brought it into Neolithic time, right? Post the Fertile Crescent uh, revolution of agriculture revolution, it became in addition, uh, the factor that was in addition to alcohol. So alcohol was the next factor brought into what was causing gout. So when the body breaks down basically ATP and a lot of other things, and we're gonna to get to this, it makes its own purine. So it's not that you only eat purines, you make your own pur purine. Some of what we'll get to in a second of what you eat will cause your purines, your endogenous productions of purines to increase. And that's a big deal. So then the sugar arrives. Here's Henry VIII. Henry VIII had a 52 inch waist. He weighed 392 pounds otherwise known as 28 stone, uh, by the end of his reign, and the metabolic burden grew, and the liver suffered. It went from fat accumulates in the liver, as we've talked about, and we'll hit again about fructose, and too much glucose goes into fat, right, through the polyol pathway. Fat plus inflammation is scarring, gets worse, and scar tissue, the liver starts to die out. And the uric acid increased, and the incidence of gout escalated. And this is just the second phase. This changed everything. Sucrose, glucose, and fructose changed everything. Suddenly it's so much everybody can have it. Certainly it was the wealthy and then it trickled down that everybody could have it. So it's glucose and fructose together. It's called sucrose. Whoever imagined a spoonful of sugar could turn so deadly. Some fructose is good. A lot is bad. Good news, bad news. This is basically how fructose gets converted to glucose. But when it it, not everything. When you have too much fructose, it can't convert to glucose. And then it goes right here, gets converted to fat because basically we run out of uh, phosphate. And if we already have a high amount of glucose, we're not going to want it to go fructose to glucose. 
basically goes charging off to making fat. So we get fat. If it's in the good old days, it was seasonal fat, so we could live on it in the winter. Great. That doesn't happen anymore, and that's not really a good reason. So what happens, a critical amount that makes fructose go to fat is when you run out of phosphate. Elevated fructose consumption is implicated in a lot of different things. High blood pressure, insulin resistance, oxidative stress, inflammation, high uric acid, of course, hypertriglycerolemia, of course, that's what I've just told you about. It makes fat, it makes triglycerides, okay. Increases all these things, which are associated with the development and worsening of liver diseases and cardiogenic diseases. Okay, this is the heart of what we're talking about. This is the heart of what happens when we have so much glucose. What happens when we have so much fructose? It doesn't always get converted to fat. Depending on the organ, most organs can convert excess fructose and glucose into fat. But your eye, your kidney, and your nerve cells cannot. They only get partway through this thing called the sorbitol, the polyol pathway, and then they start to damage those tissues. And this is what's happening. That's why those who are gout often have cataracts. Those who are gout have neurological issues and kidney issues. Leonardo da Vinci was a contemporary of Henry VIII, not the seventh, the eighth, who also suffered from gout. So it wasn't just opulent. <laughs> it was anybody who had access to that. He was quite a partier from what I heard, besides being a genius. How it happened. So we had diet high in purines, then we had the alcohol and the sugar, which is the fructose and the glucose. In excess, cause your liver to produce purines, right? After the sugar arrived to Western Europe, it was just a matter of time for more and more people to have more and more sugar and more and more alcohol. So the incidence was gonna to start to go up. And so suddenly we have so much alcohol that that has to be dealt with. So we deal with that for about nearly 8,000 years and along comes sugar. Sugar, sucrose, sucrose, fructose, and glucose, sugar. That blows it up completely. So three phases of uric acid getting progressively higher and higher. Initially, it was a good thing. And initially, it was a good thing because it made fruit. When you had too much fruit and too much glucose, it quickly got converted to fat. And fat was the seasonal thing, right? Fructose is in the late summer and fall. We don't have anything to eat in the winter, remember? So you have the, the omega-6 from the grains as they started coming in, and you had the fruit, the fructose, and the extra glucose. So we're getting fat in the fall. We're using that fat in the winter, and then the spring we're out to hunt again. So the first phase was when it was just we had grains. This is now, we're talking 10,000 years ago, going forward from the agricultural revolution. So now we're having grains, which is a higher glucose, uh, available on a regular basis now. And we're having alcohol. Okay, having alcohol. Well, that was interesting. So we had alcohol roughly for about, oh, eight or nine or 10,000 years before sugar arrived. Sucrose. Imagine that. 8,000 years, alcohol was there, it was getting very sophisticated, all sorts of wines, there were traded, there were luxury goods all over the place. And you had uh, all sorts of beers, you had all sorts of distilled spirits. It was quite robust, perhaps equal to what it is right now. So then along comes the discovery, like everything else was brought in that, well, there's this plant in Papua New Guinea, sugarcane. And so it gradually migrated over 4,000 years, migrated from the uh, East Indies, we now call them, right? The, that's, a, that's part of Indonesia, all the way over finally to the Middle East, the Fertile Crescent, seven to 800 years AD to get to the Mediterranean area and Eastern Europe. So now there's a whole thing of sugar and sugar becomes this huge specialty. I mean, phenomenal specialty. It was Middle East, it was Muslim, and he had the Iberian Peninsula, which is Spain now. That was big Muslim, so the sugar just rushed right in on the, with the help of the Muslims, and they were clearly in charge of it. Then it became Italian in, in Venice, and then it became gradually more and more part of Europe. And it finally got to the UK, England specifically, around the year 1000. Boy, hmm. Around the year 1000. But wait a minute, Henry VIII lived around 1500. 
Leonardo da Vinci lived around 1500. Columbus lived around 1500. Well, the first case of gout was back 5,000 years ago, 2,600 years ago BC. So about 5,000 years ago. So gout started well before sugar was even available. Well before sugar was even available. So it was alcohol and purines there. The story was simple. Two variables. And then it went on to alcohol purines, meaning animal meats, the sardines, the herring, the dried fish, the organ meats, and alcohol, okay? And then it became all of that plus sugar, fructose, if you will. But the next phase that's coming up is the phase of really the last 70 years. None of that that I've told you explains why have the rates of gout, or we're using gout as a surrogate, as a marker, as a vector for elevated uric acid, right? Elevated uric acid. So the incidence of gouts have gone nuts in the last 70 years. That's the third phase. The third phase, is, as I've talked about in other videos, is the alcohol sugars. It is the uh, C8, the linolenic acid, the plant oils that are being used, and it's a number of other things that I've already talked about. But let's take a look and get to it. All right, so the third phase. Now you see the first phase was basically alcohol and carbohydrates, right? A lot of alcohol, and it was pretty common. It was the working man's after working on the pyramid treat. Then it was the sugar that showed up, depending where you lived, from the Middle East, 700, 6700 AD to 1000 plus in the UK. And it took all of Europe by storm. It was amazing. It was so valuable at times, it was more valuable than gold, it is claimed. To make a whole mosque of sugar, incredible. Okay, third phase is this, pretty straightforward. Global gout and uric acid increase. Why is that happening? It looks like this. So the first phase is really, you could say it's Paleolithic, Neolithic, up to the point of sugar being introduced. Because there it was primarily alcohol and bread, if you will, carbs. And that was new. So that was roughly about 8,000 years of just that availability. Plenty of alcohol, right? Said that enough times. And then the sugar, sugar is added to that. So that plus, of course, the organ meats have always been there. Now it's the third variable, if you will. Not everybody was excess in organ meats, but they ate everything pretty much back then. And then it comes to the 1950s. What happened in the 1950s? Antibiotics started increasing. We talked about that. A third of excretion of uric acid is out of the intestine. Well, you're, you're, whether you're taking antibiotics or whether antibiotics are in the things that you are eating, like animal meats, that's a problem. We won't even get into pesticides and everything else, but those are documented issues. Sugar, obviously, is increasing even more and more, but it's the alcohol sugars that have zoomed up and the omega-6, and the fact, I guess, if you want to add in fructose again as an independent and the high fructose corn syrup, so sugar increased because it became cheaper. Omega-6, that was a replacement of all the, uh, they wanted polyunsaturated fatty acids. All the vegetable oils are omega-6, so it's not olive oil, it's not uh, palm oil, and there you go. So this, the last 70 years, the rates have just skyrocketed. The one thing that I'm not talking about right here are the deficiencies that also happen in the last 70 years. And they will talk about them next time. Too many variables. So the cause of gout and elevated uric acid has gotten bigger. It went from high purines, high alcohol, high purines, high alcohol, and high fructose, which become bigger and bigger and bigger. But then we added all those other things. So that's why I think that the explanation, conventional medical perspective explanation of gout and elevated uric acid is dangerously simplistic of these components, as they will portray, of fructose, alcohol, and purines, that clearly fructose is a big deal for most people. It wasn't my issue, and I had my issues. So when did the fructose theory of hyperuricemia take hold? Elevated uric acid levels due to fructose become accepted understanding and why? And the four variables of gout and uric acid today, the reality for many of us are that it's more than this high purines, high alcohol, and high fructose. The fourth variable over the last 70 years is what I just showed you, are all the other factors, the alcoholic sugars, the antibiotics, uh, the omega-6, and if you want to add in deficiencies, I'll get into that later, but it's vitamin C, vitamin D, and certainly omega-3. Here we go, phase one, phase two, phase three. This calamity is modern medicine. Now you can start plugging in the first documented case 
5,000 years ago, Hippocrates, Alexander the Great, Charlemagne. Charlemagne was just about the time sugar was coming into Europe. Alcohol and sugar, Henry VIII, Leonardo da Vinci, the founding fathers, certainly, in the United States, former United States, and on it goes. Represented in a different way, it looks like this. These are all the things we have added in terms of what your body has to process. We have the alcohol, we have the fructose and glucose that comes through sucrose, right? It's all the alcohol sugars, low dose aspirin, haven't talked about that a little bit, antibiotics, omega-6 seed oils. The list is huge. And insulin, we'll get into that next week. So this is what's happening that make the uric acid go up. So it is not just one thing. All of these factors cause increased levels of uric acid. So next we'll talk about nutrient deficiencies that contribute to uric acid. Did we go from bad to worse when we talked about alcohol sugars and the polyol story? There you go. If you want that in detail, that's what we talked about. It's important to have that as a background understanding. So we wanted to answer what has changed globally over the last 70 years. I think we've now identified what is going on here and why it's not as simple as it was. It's not one size fits all. It's a concept of understanding that you need to put around your life if you're bothered by this. And then you get to find out what are the big factors? Are the big factors appropriate to you or is it something else? You know they have gone up around the world, UK, Canada, China, Hong Kong. The only way to know your factors are is the only way I know what my factors are is that you need to know your levels, both fasted and throughout your day. You either get tested, so you go down and ask your doctor to test you, or you go get tested by yourself, and you can go on the link to this video. In every video I do, there's a link to get your own tested through uh, Ulta Labs. We get nothing out of it. Go do it, it's a good thing to do. You need to learn about yourself. Or you can get a meter, and this is what we use for our meter. Here's our lab results. We've talked about this before. That's the meter that we use which I, I think highly of because it's a glucometer, it's a ketometer, it measures your uric acid, it measures your cholesterol. So you can use it as one or you can use it as all four. That's the link to this particular video for that. I hope you do it. This is what it looks like. Glucose, cholesterol, ketones, and uric acid. It's something you need to do to take care of yourself. This is actionable information. Take it, look at it. If this isn't your problem, then you don't. I wouldn't be interested in. But if uric acid is high, and by the way, a lot of people who don't get gout still have high uric acid. It's what they call symptomatic versus asymptomatic. Gotta say it, the weather here is stupendous today. This is the last, we are the end of October, and each day is kind of precious, and eventually it gets like the rest of the world, the northern hemisphere, cloudy and cold, and you incubate for a while, right? You get fat like we did before, and you feed on it through winter. No, not at all. So the third phase is a phase in the last 70 years, and it's really become catastrophic for no less than the words. You know, it's like not only did we have everything they had before, we had the alcohol, then we had the layering of the sugar, which really torched the incidence of, of gout, and that's where we measure it historically. Those were reported. You know, it was the unwalkable disease of Hippocrates, as I mentioned. And so now we're at a place of, instead of getting healthier, we have the omega-6s, which clearly are relative to uric acid. They are uh, keeping the uric acid boxed in. In other words, it can't be excreted out with the urine and the stool. That's pretty bad. We have the antibiotics. We have the, um, I can't think of all the different things now. Those are the two to add on top of it. They had the alcohol. Uh, sugars, that was stupendous. And so the reason I got into explaining any of this is not just looking for a topic, is because I had gout. You know, it was kind of vague, it was a gout, it was a pseudo gout, and then it happened again. And I go, I really need to look into this. I am not gonna be a person who's gonna have this for the rest of my life. And I realized, well, look what happened with the alcohol sugars. Look at these other things. I wasn't doing much in the way of omega-6, but omega-6 is in my food. It's in the pork, it's in the egg yolks, unless I have a perfect pork or I have the omega-3 egg yolks. I don't have that. Those are not available to me yet, but I will make that change as we get to it. It's my reality. So I'm not trying to say I live the perfect world. I'm saying what I had to do to find out about how is this happening? So my story was not about fructose, fructose. My story is not about alcohol. I hope I have some alcohol. I love the dry farm wines. Um, it's not about the omega-6. It hasn't been about antibiotics for oh, a decade anyway. So the story was harder to understand, but when it came to alcohol sugars, yes, I was using those. I was, we were using xylitol in a number of the things that we've put together. I'm mostly a stevia guy, but 
the things, and I loved organ meats. And so when I backed off in the organ meats and I stopped with the xylitol, those are the big pieces on my chessboard. They might not be with you. So I'm not saying it's not organ meats. I'm not saying it's not dietary protein, purines. I'm saying more than likely, if you're standard American diet, it's clearly the sugar, the sucrose, and the fructose story. So you will have a fructose story. If you're drinking a lot of alcohol, it's an alcohol story for sure. But for me, it really wasn't those things. So ongoing. Next time we're going to cover what deficiencies most of us have that also add to raising the uric acid levels that haven't been discussed and then medications. Till next time. So if this is something that you're interested in, that is a topic that I obviously go deeper in, in terms of labs, in terms of how to do it, in terms of why you would want to do it, various topics, as you've seen that I've done in the past, then please let me know below in a comment. Till then.